Test, test, test. Hi, everybody. Good, good evening. Hi, everyone. Wow. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Can I just ask everyone in the back to come to the front? There are many more seats right here in the front. Premium seats. Go get them. <laughs> Those are the best ones. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit. Welcome to Ava. Wow. Can we all like can we all take one moment and just enjoy this and look around to your left, to your right, to the back, and just appreciate this? <laughs> My name is Julia. I'm the executive director of AVA International, the organization organizing the AVA summits. And um, it's a great, great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight and to welcome you to the first day of AVA this year. Like I always do, I really want to know who is here for the first time? Who joins an AVA event for the very first time? Can you believe it? Wow! So many people, welcome to all of you, a special welcome to the first timers. So we're going to have a very exciting three days ahead of us. And um, next I would like, I would actually like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather for this event is the tr traditional stolen land from indigenous peoples and pay our respect to both elders past and present. We have much to learn from their cultures, and we encourage all of our attendees to further research their history. You can find some resources on our website on how to support the tribes. We, as a group, AVA International, has done the same and will continue to support and acknowledge the Native people. AVA International is a young organization. This is only the fourth major event that we're organizing, so it really feels very much like we are just getting started. Um, and I cannot tell you how much our whole team has been looking forward to welcoming everyone again, to feeling this energy, to celebrating the community, and to share meals with really friends from all across the world. But you know, Ava is not just that. This is not just uh, nice to have fun gathering for people to catch up and to hang out. It's not a fun circus traveling around the world. It is a little bit. But <laughs> my point is, this conference is where the most relevant topic in our movements are being discussed. It's where funding and finances are being discussed. Um, we saw this today during our very first Grantees Day where 64 organizations from the movement, most of them from the Global South, with formerly very little access to significant funding, had the opportunity to pitch in front of 13 major funders and foundations. And Grantees Day is a really good example of how AVA is trying to bring new formats to our movement every year. Um, this is the first time that we did this, so there are already a lot of learnings and a lot of feedback that we got. Um, but our goal is always to be as equitable and transparent and fair as possible. Um, and we're very hopeful that formats like Grantees Day will create more access to funders in the movement. Ava, yeah, please give it up for that. Thank you. <laughs> AVA is also the place where we agree and disagree about strategies, about management styles, about priorities. Um, that's why in our program, and I hope the next slide will show you access to the program, is we're, we're, you'll see that we're not shying away from having difficult conversations, especially this year. So we really encourage you to check out the sessions and go to the program as well. Um, we're going to talk about burnout in the movement. We're going to talk about controversial tactics like investigations and rescue and corporate partnerships, about why it is so important that vegans are actually healthy, 
and what if they're not, and about what we did wrong as leaders. So all of this is to say that in the end, of course, we as organizers can only provide the platform. And it's really you who are bringing this summit to life. And before we start tonight's program, I want to share a few things with you. So first of all, I want to share with you that the city of Alexandria, which is where the summit is taking place, um, has, due to like a collaboration between Ava and Planted Society, um, announced or officially proclaimed the next two weeks the plant-based for the planet weeks. <laughs> and, and I'm gonna read to you a statement of Mayor Justin M. Wilson, who says, Alexandria is recognized as prime location for the Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit, which brings together leaders in sustainability, that's you, I encourage all of our citizens to explore and embrace plant-based dining options and recognize our local businesses for their contributions. This week celebrates our collective effort towards a healthier community and a thriving planet. And we also have some welcoming remarks coming up from Councilwoman Aaliyah Gaskins, who is welcoming the AVA Summit to her city. Let's hear what she has to say. I hope the clicker works. It doesn't. Here we go. And we need some sound. Alexandria. I am thrilled to support Plant-Based for the Planet. As someone with a background in public health and urban planning, I know how important this initiative is, not only to our individual health, but our goals for climate change and sustainability. All right. Well, give it up one more time for our partners at Planted, who made this possible. I think I need to point to this direction better, right? Okay. So we also, I also want to show you a cross section or like a profile of the movement organizations that are gathering this year at the summit. We are welcoming 270 organizations from all across the world this year. This is our, our record. Um, this is only counting nonprofit groups working in the movement, not universities and for profits, and there are a lot more other organizations. This is just the nonprofits. Um, and I came up with some variables that I hope will be interesting to you as well, because it turns out that of these 270 organizations, the clicker has some issues tonight, but that's okay. Oh no! No, no, no. <laughs> we got a lot of attendees this year from many countries, but that's going to come later. <laughs> All right, this is like the worst thing that can happen at an opening <laughs> night. <laughs> OK, so out of these 270 organizations, 48% are women-led. Let's hear those women especially. Okay. I'll try to hit it harder. Next up, 22% of these groups are BIPOC-led, which is great, but that's one out of five, basically. There is still a lot of room for improvement here, right? So let's hear a little bit louder your applause for this group, please. And 35% of the organizations present here are younger than five years. That really shows us how much our movement is growing in just in the last five years, right? That's pretty impressive. So one more round of applause for that. Thank you. All right, so you already saw this. We actually have close to 800 people here. This, for this event, which is our record, again, one more time, um, from 49 different countries. So we're gonna, we're gonna see where everybody is from in this room. I'm gonna go by continent, so whenever your continent shows up, 
Make sure you cheer. We're going to start. All right, let's go one more time. <laughs> We're going to start with Asia. Who is from Asia? Let's hear our Asian folks. All right. We have people joining from Australia. Maybe not this evening, but are, yeah, a few, okay. <laughs> Everybody from Africa. All right. Nice. What about Europe? Wow, the clicker is so bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is all the European countries, by the way, so pretty strong representation. Next up is... I think we need new batteries for the clicker. <laughs> South America and North America is probably the biggest group. All right. So again, 49 different countries. All of you can hear from more than 100 speakers in 73 sessions. I think I'm just going to stop using the presentation because, OK, well, <laughs> now it's very fast. Thank you to the team. I'll just stop using this for now. It's all good. No, no worries. So new clicker. New clicker. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So this all would not be possible without the help of many, many helping hands and amazing people who are dedicated to making this happen. First of all, thank you so much to our team. Can we get a really big round of applause for the team, please? Thank you. We also really recommend all of you join us on the Whova app. It's really useful for you to access the program, to see who is here, to plan your meetings, to schedule meetups. Um, we also have like some spontaneous announcements sometimes that we, that we send out. So that's useful. This is you know, what I was supposed to say before. Thank you all also to our amazing advisory committee who has been super helpful in you know, helping us setting up the program speaker selection process, giving us various types of feedback, providing their diverse perspectives on the program. Can we all give a really big, big applause, please, to the advisory committee? And now, of course, we also want to thank our funders and our sponsors who are making this event possible for us. The bronze sponsors, many of them you can find in the exhibit hall right next to here throughout the event. Please check out their booth and, you know, um, go talk to them. Thank you to our silver sponsors. We have Animal Outlook, Cliff, Culture Canopy, Dr. Bronner's, Impossible, Know Your Elephants, Love Corn, Lush, Numu, Plant Burger, and Priority Visions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> At the gold level, animal equality, mercy for animals, and the Tipping Point Foundation. And of course, a very special thank you to our platinum supporters. Those are the philanthropic supporters the Craigslist Charitable Foundation, the Greenbaum Foundation, Open Philanthropy, Fauna, and Vegan Grants. I would also like to thank the AV team who is setting up all of the stages for us, the lights, the decoration, all of the hotel staff, the chef, please do check out the hotel restaurant upstairs. They have amazing vegan options this all, all week. There's a little marketplace as well. So can we please give it up for everyone who's working behind the scenes. Thank you so much. Now, we will hear a few welcoming remarks from our nonprofit sponsors. And the first person that I have the pleasure to introduce to you is Don Moncrief, 
from a well-fed world. Welcome, Don. Ah, oh, where is Don? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Thank you. It is. Okay. Hi. Uh, a lot of you know me, a lot of you don't. I'm Dawn Moncrief with A Well-Fed World, and we are thrilled to be a sponsor. I've misplaced my phone with a lavender case, so that's what I was out there doing. So it was important. If you find it, it's me. Um, anyway, uh, we're so thrilled to sponsor. We've been here from the kickoff just a couple years ago, and... Um, this is my favorite place to be. I look forward to it every year and even the predecessor. Uh, just a couple quick things so you know, we're on the table right out there. We work on plant-based solutions for global hunger. So if you're into food systems, food security, uh, we do hunger relief, uh, supporting them with some small grants. And we also are fiscal sponsors. So if you're one of these new groups or another new group, uh, we do fiscal sponsorships, uh, low cost and free. So check us out for that. We also facilitate some grants, but, um, and climate. So we are doing a lot more with climate change now. And I will be speaking Sunday morning around 10 o'clock, 10, 15, on climate veg advocacy. So you can find out more there. Oh, we have a climate-friendly food guide, which is very nice in the magazines. And you can take that. You can take a bunch if you want to take some home for advocacy. And we also have a lot of handouts, which are great for advocacy. And so I'm just going to keep it really short. I'm so, so grateful to be here. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry for running late. I would just keep the energy going. That's all. That's all. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, and I look forward to seeing a lot of you uh, during the conference. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. And the next person, please give a very warm welcome to our sponsor. Nope. I'm so sorry. Everything is going wrong. The Animal Legal Defense Fund. Please give it up for Chris Green, everyone. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We have a short part of time, and I'm a very fast talker, so uh, seatbelts on, please. Um, yeah, just really want to say it's so grateful um, to be here and, and, and we're proud to be a sponsor of this, uh, this, uh, this wonderful event. Um, been in each year, we've had many years before under the, the different incarnation and really want to thank Taylor and Julia and Amanda and the whole team for everything they've done to make this such a wonderful event. So a round of applause for them, please. So, uh, so some nice milestones going on. Uh, this year we are celebrating ALDF's 45th year in existence after being founded in 1979 by Joyce Tischler, our founder. So that's a, a really wonderful milestone for us. So cheers to Joyce. Having the foresight to start this all the way back in 1979. Um, and you know, for the longest time we were the sole uh, animal protection organization that was focused exclusively on using the legal system to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals. Uh, it's great to see now that there are others doing the same, but uh, it's been a really wonderful niche and something we think is vitally important. Um, to give you a sense on how far the field has come, uh, it's this year also marks 24 years uh, since I took the first animal law course that, that Harvard Law School offered back in, 19, or in 2000. And at the time, Harvard was only like the fourth or fifth school to teach an animal law course. And it was literally such progressive news. It was like front page news in the New York Times. Um, now, 24 years later, uh, 167 law schools have taught a course in animal law at one time or another. So it just really shows you how far we've come. And a note that that first course was taught by my dear friend and mentor, Steve Wise, who we lost a couple months ago. So let's please recognize Steve and what a wonderful trailblazing pioneer he's been for the movement. Um, this very week also marks 11 years since I first started ALDF as their an original legislative director. Um, after that, I went to Harvard Law School for eight years and helped launch and, 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 and build the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program there, which was so amazing being able to attach Harvard's name to this issue that, that means so much to all of us. But it was really great nine months ago to return to ALDF and, and help them through. I think it's, it's no secret that ALDF had faced some challenges in recent years, uh, fortunately not with any of the substantive work, but more some, some cultural issues. Uh, but I'm very proud to say that in October, uh, as a result of those issues, 
um, we were one of the first animal protection organizations to unionize. Uh, but I'm proud to announce that in October, we signed our first collective bargaining agreement and we could not have a better partnership with our union. We are really like co-pilots in a, in a plane, really making sure that we make ALDF like the most supportive environment to do this really important work. Um, so we've also brought a bunch of amazing new leadership in as well. Uh, I won't, we don't have time to name them all here. But um, it's also clear that you know, diversity has been an issue in our movement generally, but especially within the legal realm. And so we've, one thing we've been doing for that, we have some scholarships and uh, internships for uh, students from historically black colleges and universities, also students working in tribal law. And so these provide not only scholarships, but also recipients of these scholarships then will work with, get a paid uh, clerkship with us for a summer or so we can expose them to this work and hopefully make them realize this is a wonderful career path that that's option and just removing any of those barriers that we can. Um, we're also working on a, a project to um, provide grants for people to sort of take the LSAT and re again, removing any other barriers we have that, that people might have to, to joining the movement in, in the legal realm. Um, one thing that makes ALDF unique is that we have this huge network now of student organizations and all the various law schools that we help see. And again, by doing events and, 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 and doing direct work, they can really expose all their other classmates to these issues and bring them in because not everyone has the luxury of being able to decide to go work in nonprofits for the rest of their lives. People have different life backgrounds and, and different needs. So, but there are a lot of wonderful folks who really care about these issues who decide to go work at a large firm and they wanna spend some of that time. So ALDF has this network of pro bono attorneys. There's now 2,700 lawyers in this network. And over the past 10 years, they've done tens of thousands of hours of, of legal work, free legal work, that amounts to over $40 million of paid legal work, and this is free money to the movement. So all these really kick-ass lawyers out there doing this work and pulling it in. So lastly, you know, not only internally, I've been working internally on ALDF from some of the issues, but also externally. Um, coming from the legislative side of things, I'm all about collaboration and team building. And right now it's really wonderful that we have this opportunity to coalesce around uh, Prop 12 and question three and, 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 and the attempts to overturn those legislatively in the farm bill. You know, as animal advocates, we're sort of like the Lilliputians, right? We're up against these multi-billion dollar industries. The only way we're ever gonna have any chance of success is to coalesce and collaborate. And it's wonderful to have this opportunity. And I think it's gonna be the ultimate trifecta, not only getting question three and Prop 12 passed in the first place, defending it all the way through the US Supreme Court. But now, if we're able to win this fight and this open field fight with industries throwing everything they have at it and keep anything EATS Act or anti-Prop 12 language out of the Farm Bill, they're not gonna get another chance for five years and by then, most of the producers will have complied. So um, this very week, we're likely to see the Republicans' language on this and everyone's gearing up and it's been so wonderful being part of this great coalition. And uh, yeah, just, just call to arms. You know, If you get anything related to, to each of the Farm Bill, pick up the phone, call your member of Congress, put pressure on, because this is a fight I think we can really win. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. The next person I have the pleasure to introduce is Brooke Haggerty from Phonolytics. Please give it up for Brooke. <laughs> Thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much, Julia. Hey, everybody. How you doing? How we feeling? I am so excited to see what a wonderful room of animal advocates. Greetings, I'm Brooke Haggerty. I'm the executive director of Faunalytics. For those of you who know us, hello. It is awesome to see you here. For those of you who don't, Faunalytics helps animal advocates by conducting research, supporting you one-on-one, -on -one, and hosting a massive online library of research related to animal advocacy around the globe. So it's a real honor to sponsor this event because you are why we exist and we're really excited to help you. I'm curious to know who here has used research or data to inform or support your advocacy? Dang, I wish I had a camera right now. That is so exciting to see. We have worked alongside so many of you to conduct research. Mercy for Animals, Animal Equality, Farm Sanctuary, Sentient. We have a study right now with New Roots Institute and many more. And I also wanna give a quick shout out to my fellow animal protection capacity builders. So Hive, Vegan Hacktivist, Scarlet Spark, Animal Advocacy Careers and many others, it's an honor to be one of you. 
But even though Faunalytics has been around for over 24 years now, there are so many more of you that we still want to support. This year alone, we have helped over 70 organizations through our free office hours program. This is everybody from grassroots advocates to major international organizations. And we are actually hosting in-person office hours here at the AVA Summit, so please come by our booth, say hello, ask us your questions, and tell us what research and data you want to see from us. That's why we're here. Come say hello. Speaking of research, though, I do want to highlight just a couple examples of our work to give you a little bit of a flavor. Our latest study looked at how animal protection organizations can form meaningful collaborations with the environmental movement. We just launched a new series called Tactics in Practice where we summarize the latest research on a given advocacy topic. And later this month, we're going to publish a study that we conducted in partnership with Good Growth, which looks at the needs and strategies of organizations in over 80 different countries, something that I do hope will be useful for funders in the room as well. And I'd also like to highlight one more resource. It's one of our most popular, our global slaughter statistics and charts. We just published a new version of this on, yesterday, on Wednesday, and the update is a pretty significant one. We visually summarize the totals of animals slaughtered around the world, and it really illuminates the massive scale of what we're all up against. But even though these numbers are devastating, it's conferences like this one. It's the AVA Summit that really proves that we are not alone in our fight to make animals' lives better. So these are just a few examples of over 6,000 research reports, study summaries, infographics, and videos that Faunalytics hopes will help inform your work. We're really committed to producing research that is immediately useful to you as animal advocates because we may be data nerds, but we are actually advocates too. And so we only succeed when you all do. So please don't be a stranger. Come by our booth. We're right outside. Talk to us. Get to know us. We really want to get to know you if we don't already. And when you get home, be sure to look up faunalytics.org. When you think of data, please think of faunalytics. You know, I really don't know if we're going to end factory farming in our lifetime but I know we are sure as hell gonna try. And Faunalytics is gonna be there beside you every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much. And the last, the last nonprofit sponsor at the platinum level I have the pleasure to introduce to you is Sebastian Joy from ProVet International. Please give it up. Thank you, Sebastian. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Sebastian, and instead of giving yet another speech, uh, we decided to record a little video because we also agreed that makes it a bit easier to stick to the three-minute time limit. So, but let me see if that actually works with the clicker. Yes. Volume up, please. Provich International's mission is to reduce the global consumption of animal products by 50% by 2040. A compassionate food system is our goal, but we cannot do it alone. This is why Provich launched Kickstarting for Good. With our new program, we help to launch new nonprofits, impact initiatives working to this mission and transform the global food system. We're looking for those hidden gems, those organizations that are working on very important issues that are also highly neglected and aren't being worked on by many other advocates. Projects and ideas ideas that are highly tractable and tangible and that we know can achieve success. We will accompany you on your journey, whether you are just starting with your idea or looking to accelerate your initiative. You will take part in an expert-led program with tailored-made workshops, mentoring, networking and fundraising. Honestly, the journey from kind of like seven, eight weeks ago to now is absolutely amazing and that's essentially been with the support of the mentors along the way. They've got a huge amount of passion for the subjects and they, they've helped us enormously. Nailing down the details of how are we going to measure our impact? Why do we implement certain interventions more than others? 
and why do we choose to focus on these? So my experience with the Kickstarting for Good has been phenomenal. It's given me the motivation to launch my non-profit uh, and sort of start to build the thinking and the strategy and the planning behind it. You'll also get to team up with dozens of like-minded co-founders and at the end of the program you'll get to pitch your ideas to mission-aligned major funders and foundations. Just being around so many like-minded people who are all creating really high-impact organizations, it's just so great to like be able to collaborate with everyone and be inspired. Excellent co-founders. People that I would never have met otherwise who are committed. Meeting a diverse set of people, being exposed to a lot of ideas and perspectives. If you're thinking of starting a non-profit, I can't think of a better way or a better start for your, uh, your non-profit journey. Join our mission to transform the global food system. Apply now. Yes, thank you so much. So, Yes, yeah, so applications are open. Like two years ago, we launched three initiatives. Well, the animal at the AVA Summit, as you know, the Dietary Guidelines Initiatives, and the first Food Summit at the United Nations COP. And last year, we launched uh, Vegan Thesis. It's a platform for students. Uh, Open Pass, it's a support system using AI to support animal advocates, um, helping them use AI in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, Robbie Lockie launched the Freedom Food Alliance. Uh, we have the Reporters for Animals International, who are supporting undercover investigators. And last but not least, a German initiative pressuring church institutions to uh, increase their plant-based offerings. And if you are interested in starting your own initiative, please join our workshop tomorrow at 12.15 in Room Arbor. Thank you very much, and please spread the word. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sebastian. All right, thank you so much to our sponsors. And now everyone, I have the pleasure to introduce to you your host for the rest of the evening. You probably all know him. We'll have a very interesting discussion panel going on tonight. He led the farm animal rights movement, ProVeg US, Better Eating International. He co-created this summit and now serves on our board. Everyone, please put your hands together for the one and only Michael Weberman. <laughs> Hello, Ava 2024. It's so great to see all of you again, and I'm really excited about this panel discussion, which I will introduce uh, very shortly. Um, just, oh, is there a slide that's just to the name of the discussion or something? I'm not, I'm not Sebastian. There we go. <laughs> um, just uh, one uh, note, since uh, Julia did say that I'm on the board and I've had several people already either be surprised that I couldn't answer specific questions about this year's AVA Summit or ask me if something was wrong that I'm not listed as a staffer. Uh, I'm working on progressive political work right now that is not AVA related, which is why you haven't seen my name all over this, but AVA is my my, uh, my heart and my home. The AVA Summit is, uh, I think, the best thing I've ever really had the pleasure of working on, and I love this event very much. I'm honored to serve on its board. I do not know almost anything about this year's AVA Summit except the uh, two panels that I am moderating. So if I can't answer your questions, that's the only reason why. And uh, But I am, once again, so happy, as always, to share this space with you. I believe that these events are really the only way that we can, as Brooke said, keep this fight moving forward uh, uh, for animals, and I also believe that these events need to reckon honestly with uh, both what's going well in our movement and also sometimes what is not uh, going so well in our movement or in the world as it is. Uh, we can only solve problems that are named, um, and so solving problems means that we do have to actually talk about them honestly. It means we have to uh, strike a balance, right? We can't uh, fall into despair and only, uh, you know, we, we can't, yeah, we can't, when we think about them, become so overwhelmed that we can't address them, but we can't uh, fall into magical thinking on the other side where we believe the world is going to become vegan just because we believe the world's gonna become vegan. 
uh, our belief in a vegan world is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Uh, we have to believe the world can become vegan in order to make it vegan, but we also need to uh, reckon with the truth and do the work that it's gonna take to get us there. And that's one reason that we're so pleased to have our two uh, panelists uh, for this evening, because they're gonna talk with us and walk us through uh, you know, their thinking and their experience on some of the ways that they have actually uh, dealt with uh, some real crises that have come into their own organizations and our movement. And so uh, without further um, ado, you know, uh, delay, let's please bring on uh, Kitty Block and Max Elder. And uh, by the way, uh, the Whova app, which is the app that we've used to organize this event, has an option where you can ask questions uh, within it. And uh, as we go on through this discussion, we would love if you would ask them questions via the app. We don't have a, an open floor mic or anything like that. Uh, the reasons uh, for that are that one, uh, we find that uh, letting uh, democracy kind of win and letting you upvote the questions that you like the most is a good way for us to ensure that we're answering the most important questions. I also think we've all dealt with someone whose question is a nine minute belief of theirs with a question mark uh, at the very end of it. And uh, so we're just trying to ensure that the questions that you ask are actually questions for our two esteemed panelists here. And uh, before we get into these questions, I wanted to give both Kitty and Max an opportunity to introduce themselves, their work, tell a bit of their story, specifically maybe how your story pertains uh, to any of the um, difficulties that you've experienced in the movement before and uh, what maybe your perspective is on how you, uh, you know, solve problems and tackle them head on. Uh, so Kitty, if you wanna start or? All right, well, thank you. Well, welcome everyone, it's great to be here. I put my hand up as a first timer for this conference. I can't believe this is my first time here, but I am so excited to be here with you all. So I've been in the movement a long time um, and with the last 32 years at the Humane Society of the United States, but also with our affiliate Humane Society International building the great work that all of you are doing um, around the world with our partners. And uh, listening to Chris speak about ALDF, I have to laugh. I just told him a moment ago that after I graduated from law school, first place I applied was ALDF. But no, no, didn't get the job, so I'll, I'll give them a call. Um, yeah, sorry, we'll talk later. And uh, so actually my first, my first job out of law school was with uh, PETA, thank you. And I was there for a few years until I started at HSUS where we built our investigations team and I was doing the legal work. Loved everything about it. And I think for the last 32 years, I joke that I've probably had every job in the organization. So when a staff person comes to me and is like, this is hard, I don't know if you know, I was like, I think I had your job, so yes. Um, but uh, the last uh, almost six years have probably been the most uh, trying uh, and the most difficult, of course, um, because we went through a lot of changes, important changes. And I'm really excited about answering some questions because I think, well, I know the work we do is so vitally important and the best way to build the strongest organization is to really run it like a business. We all have heart. We all have drive, but we have to make sure we have the right structures, the transparency, the right culture, the work in place, so st staff can focus on doing the work, and we can make sure that we are running a great organization. So lots of lessons learned, and happy to share them with you. No. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Max. I am so honored to be here with you all. I don't know about you, but uh, just walking around Ava gives me so much energy. It gives me so much light. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm sitting next to Kitty Block on stage, which is just like an honor. Um, and yeah, Julia, I know the clicker might not, but um, we all love you. So thank you for doing all of this. I am excited to chat with everyone. Uh, I hope that this is a panel discussion, but more of a conversation. So please submit questions, questions, questions. We wanna hear from you. 
We have lots of thoughts, um, but I'm most interested to hear what you want to talk about. Um, so uh, who the hell am I? Uh, I currently manage a philanthropy foundation called Food System Innovations. We're a philanthropic impact platform trying to accelerate the protein transition. Um, but I think I'm here today mainly because before that I ran a plant-based meat company for a few years, we're called Nowadays, um, that failed. And we shut it down uh, last summer. Before that, I was a long-term strategy and innovation consultant across the global food value chain. I was a um, professional food futurist, which does, is a job title, um, at a place called the Institute for the Future, which was a spin-off of the Rand Corporation in the late 60s. And um, for the past 11 or 12 years, I've been a fellow at the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics, which is a think tank in the UK, pioneering ethical perspectives on animals. There's actually a documentary tonight uh, screening um, called The Animal Thing, which um, chronicles the life of Andrew Lindsay, who is the um, executive director of the center. Um, so care a lot about animal ethics, care a lot about food system transformations, care a lot about alternative proteins as a cornerstone of our theory of change for how to get uh, animals uh, out of those food systems. And yeah, I'm excited to share some learnings. I think um, very kind of top of mind for me at least is just like a fundamental problem that I'm excited that you all are hopefully working on, which is a problem with demand. It turns out that um, meat is really problematic for the world. I don't need to tell you all that, uh, except meat is not a big problem for most consumers. And therein lies the rub. We need to find what's called product market fit. We need to find um, a supply of alternative protein products that meet demand at the price, taste, nutrition, and kind of the, with the right value props to not just get people to try a product, but forget people to love a product, forget people to repeat purchase. And the past couple of years of the industry has been um, years that have been chronicled by sort of like venture capital excitement, lots of sort of blitz scaling, so a willingness to pursue kind of inefficient growth strategies with the idea that a nascent category and emerging players can kind of dominate a market and grow really quickly. It only works though if you're actually solving a problem for people and you can't sell people something that doesn't solve a problem for them. We know that alternative protein products solve problems for the world. They certainly solve problems for animals. Um, but in order for them to succeed at scale and for, for order, in order for us to really achieve broader market penetration, we need to figure out what problems we solve. And um, so that's the challenge. I think there's some interesting opportunities. Uh, it turns out that there are some problems we can solve. Uh, and we need to think a little bit more creatively about what those are and where those markets are, because as we all know, meat is a massive market. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, I think. Um, and I know we're gonna talk more about all this. I wanna say two quick caveats um, before we continue the conversation. One is that I have to admit, my point of view is very US focused. So I know there are lots of people in this room from around the world, um, don't listen to me, <laughs> or at least take a, 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 add a few grains of salt because I don't have those contexts. Um, the other caveat is that um, the one thing I know is that I am wrong a lot. So uh, take what I say here as input from an N of one. Uh, it is certainly not uh, the capital T truth, and I think probably a lot of people here disagree with me about lots of this. So um, listen to them too. No, and thanks for that honesty right there. And that's, I mean, I think being wrong a lot is actually part of the point though, right? Is that we've all been wrong a lot. And I think it's easy when we're wrong to either never admit it or think about it briefly and move right on, but don't think about again what actually happened. Don't actually dive into what went wrong and, and what we can do differently um, or to wallow in it, right? So I'm the worst and I failed and I should never anything again. And so I guess... Um, one, and I, I, so I already appreciate us naming some of these problems. You use the word failed, Max, and I think that's a word people are really afraid of, right? There's no failures, there's only learnings. Well, you can learn, but sometimes there's a failure, right? Sometimes something, you set a goal, if you don't achieve anywhere near what you were trying, you, you failed, right? And it's okay, we fail sometimes. And so I would like to ask, and I know this kind of sounds like a job interview question, but uh, I think in this case, it's you know on a, in a platform that will be interesting, but what is one of the biggest failures that you've experienced or contributed to, and how did you, each of you, either of you, uh, actually come back from that, and not just privately learn from it, but bring those learnings into the world so that others, you know, so that, so that a culture or an industry or a sector or anything could also learn from that as well. All right, I'll, I'll kick it off to fail first. 
Um, I think when, when, I, when I stepped into the CEO role, uh, one of the things that I thought that could move us along in a way, I thought, all right, I'm going to be transparent, and I'm going to communicate, and I'm going to let people know that um, I don't have the answers, but I'm working on it, and I'm going to keep getting back to you. And I kept trying to think of, you know, in a crisis, you triage, and you put emphasis on different areas that you think you can have an impact. I, one of the things I did not appreciate, um, and now at the time there was a big lesson learned, is I was like, okay, we're going to work on our culture. And so we hired an outside um, company to come in and really spend time working with, getting at our norms, what are our values. And I was really eager to make that move quickly. And I kept thinking, well, we covered that. We're ready to go to that next level. It takes so long to build a culture. I, I think we all know that. We know it's built over years and years and years of how people start. Even if you started a, a, you know, six months before, you get indoctrinated into the culture. And so I think if one of the things that I could say that I wish I had just recognized, we had to take it slower, that it wasn't, it shouldn't, I shouldn't have run to try to get there because it, people were, I needed to spend more time bringing people along. I kept thinking, we don't want to be here. We've got to get there, and let's get there as soon as possible. I needed to slow down and recognize that every step was something to celebrate and keep focused on. So for me, it was really about recognizing when you need to slow it down to have it really be impactful. Yeah. My, my takeaway from that, Kitty, is that great things take time and they can't be rushed. Like when we start looking at corners and thinking they're cuttable, it's a problem. Um, and I think this is true in the nonprofit world. It's also true in uh, the alternative protein um, sector, which is we are, um, we're so excited about the potential of these products. We overestimate their impact and we expect a lot from them. And it turns out it's gonna take a long time for these products to have impact at scale and to really achieve like very meaningful market penetration that we all want and need. And that was a big learning for me. Um, you know, our alternative proteins need a value chain that doesn't really exist right now. That's gonna take a lot of time to build and cost a lot of money. We're competing in commodity markets. Um, these are high volume, low margin, industries and we are we're kind of bringing like a niche specialty knife to a commodity gunfight I mean we that wasn't my best <laughs> uh, we you know we're like we're chicken is a commodity product right the last time I checked a uh, pound of chicken and of com on the commodity market in the US cost a dollar sixty um, now granted like that's because the industry has massively externalized costs that's because the industry is massively consolidated um, but you know Tyson was founded in 1935 um, Hormel Foods, does anyone know when Hormel Foods was founded? 1891. I looked up pictures of Hormel's uh, founding the other day, they were in black and white. So we are in our infancy and we wanna move quickly and we're super excited and I feel very long-term bullish on the category as a whole, um, but we're an infant and you know what infants do? They stumble, they fall, they, especially when they're trying to move quickly, and that's not a problem. Um, I think you just name it, like, oh, we are young. We have to figure some stuff out, and that this is gonna take a long time because we're competing with an industry that's been around for a very long time, that's super efficient, and um, we need to figure out challenges like how do you commoditize plant-based meats? And no one knows how to do that, um, at least right now. We have some ideas, but um, no one's been able to do that yet. And that truly means like fungible, very high volume, very low cost products that find markets and that can truly compete um, with the products that we want to displace. So no one, um, Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers and these, even these products that are, have large distribution and are at meaningful scale still can't compete just fundamentally on cost. Um, and we need to figure out how to do that. If we can't compete with products on price, um, then we're not going to be able to compete with them at all. So we need to get price and taste to where they need to be to be competitive and then figure out what the value props are that truly are able to, um, to capture consumers' hearts and minds. Doc. 
just letting your applause happen before I ask another question. Uh, and I do have a couple uh, maybe specific questions for either of you that the other one is probably not going to maybe say any, you know, ha ha has, have as much to say back. You're welcome to, obviously. If either of you, I'm not banning it, but I don't want to make every question just super broad and open-ended. And I think I'm going to go the other way this time just because, yeah, so why not? Uh, kind of a somewhat direct reply to what Max was saying is... Um, I think in my personal opinion, you know, related, one of the myths of our movement has been that um, the only problem with the sale of animal products was, was the taste and price, that once the products were, were there, that we didn't almost need to worry about the ethical persuasion anymore, right? That it's, all, that it's only a market product and that there, we almost can somewhat avoid or ignore uh, the rationale. And I'm curious, well, one, just if you agree with me or not, that we also need to maybe be remembering that some some of the reason that people buy these products is going to be um, for values, not just for their kind of ability on the market. And whether you agree with me or not, I guess, what else do you think can be done to get the demand there, right? If, you're, if we all agree it's not just a supply problem, what is it actually going to take to, and, let, and again, to name the problems, I mean, the reality is that animal alternative sales are going down right now, right? And worse is that sales of animal products are at the highest level they have ever been. Per capita meat consumption is the highest it has ever been. And that's, you know, using the word failure earlier, right? We're, we are in some ways failing at our number one goal as a movement, which is reducing the number of animals that are being exploited and killed by humans. And so I am curious, I think either of you, of course, but Max especially, what do you think it's gonna take to get that demand there? Because I do agree with you, it's a, it's a crisis. It's a crisis that there isn't the demand that we thought there was gonna be now that these products are relatively affordable and, and tasty, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so this is such a good question. I don't know how much, we probably need like three hours to talk through it all. Um, but here's, I think- 30 seconds on the clock. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so high level, we need supply and demand side interventions. We need to do a lot of work on both. Um, supply is not gonna solve the problem. Um, demand isn't gonna solve the problem because you need these products to be in distribution. And so I think the nuance here is, I, to be very honest, I think it's a bit of a mischaracterization that people assumed that if only these products were cheap and delicious, that the problem would magically go away. I think that that's kind of a mischaracterization. I think that price, taste, nutrition are necessary, but not sufficient. So we need to solve those problems. It is not that we shouldn't be working on those. We absolutely need to solve those problems. And as someone who um, spent years of my life selling plant-based meats, you, we absolutely need to solve those problems. And um, the, the nuance, though, is that those problems aren't enough, um, and that we absolutely need to figure out where there's opportunities for demand, how to create more demand, how to really understand what the pain points are that we can solve for folks. Um, and so, yeah, one thing we're super excited about at FSI, we're a, an impact platform and we incubate some new organizations. We just launched a new organization that's here today um, called People for Better Food, which is a new C3 working on uh, cultural marketing. Because I think the insight here is, um, you know, our beliefs don't care about facts. And we, as a movement, care so much about these facts about the environmental harms and um, just the horrors of industrialized animal agriculture. But actually, we are animals that have these belief systems that we use to filter facts. And so the sort of supply side, like price, taste, and convenience, and nutrition and stuff, it's a very rational value proposition. But you all know this. We eat food not just because it's low cost and delicious, but we eat food with our culture with our history, with our family, with our expectations. Um, and so we need to figure out how to engage people in a cultural conversation just as much as we need to engage people in a conversation that this is a cheap and delicious and nutritious product. Um, so we need to do both. Uh, and yeah, I think the other thing is um, these products are just going to take a bit of time. And I feel like, um, yeah, maybe just like some patience and some understanding that we need to lay some foundational groundwork. Like, it's not obvious for consumers, but the food industry is a very antiquated and weird industry. And sort of middle of the value chain with like, just like huge food production facilities, they're really old. They're designed to make products that are not alternative protein products. And we need just like big investment in infrastructure, which is like not sexy, which venture capital doesn't want to underwrite which takes a lot of time and a lot of money, like building big factories. We don't even have the infrastructure to truly scale these products to be able to compete. And so 
I don't think that there's any expectation that these products are going to overnight solve this problem. Um, and I do think that people working in the industry understand we need more capital, we need CapEx to build manufacturing facilities, we need to work on um, demand in nuanced ways, and I think we need to be patient. The final comment here though is, um, you know, the headwinds for animal-based products are only getting worse, and the innovations in alternative proteins and the excitement and the interest is only getting better. And so I don't think it's a, it's a matter of if, I think it's a matter of when, and the question that we ask ourselves every day is how can we accelerate it? Great response, Max, yeah. <laughs> and I have a question for you unrelated to this completely, Kitty, but if you have anything to add to that first, you know, feel, feel free. I, I will only just add the comment you made about the systems being antiquated on animals. All industry that has its business on the backs of animals is antiquated. We may be in our infancy, but that is our leverage because they are antiquated systems. Innovation against animal testing of the products, it's so unnecessary. It's not, it doesn't correlate. It's bad for the animals, bad for the environment. It's okay we're in our infancy because they're antiquated. There's so much we can do. I sign off on all of that. I completely agree. Yeah, it's great. And uh, so my question for Kitty is on a complete left turn and, you know, um, for those, you know, I know we've talked about what exactly we're going to say about this, and for those who don't know at all what we're talking about, right, uh, when Kitty took over from, you know, as the CEO of Humane Society of the U.S., it was because the previous CEO had, um, you know, engaged in some, some bad, very bad behavior and created a very unhealthy uh, work environment, and y'all can, you know, Google it if you want, if you don't know about this already and want to learn more. Um, but I am really, I'll just be perfectly honest, I, when that happened, I had no trust in the organization anymore, and um, I didn't expect that I would be inviting a speaker, let alone many speakers, from HSUS to conferences just a couple of years later even. Um, and I, um, I'm curious how you so authentically built that trust back. And I don't mean in a PR, how'd you dupe everyone into coming back to you, but like really, how did you earn our movement's trust back after what could have been a death blow to another organization in the same situation? Thank you for the PTSD comment. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. Um, all big questions and it, it's important. And I think, well I know, I know what got us back was our staff. And it's, that's not a throwaway response. Um, everyone who was there at the time, uh, and I have a lot of colleagues in, in, in the audience here, so you can just, it was right or wrong. Um, they were there because of the movement. They joined because of the work we were doing. And just to keep coming back to that, the main point is there's never one individual, no matter how great you are, it's always about the movement, the organization. And if you build an organization around one person, guess what? You have not done your work for the animals. You have not done your work for the mission. <laughs> so it helped that I had been there for many years um, and I was on the Humane Society International side. When that all broke, um, came back over to the HSUS side and really just started from scratch with folks, where we needed to go, what, were the, what was most, um, what was the hardest thing to get through? How are we gonna build this together? That's really where I spent most of my time, was working with the staff. I had donors who were leaving in droves because that the former leader left because they wanted to support him. I had donors leaving in droves because that former leader was there too long. I had a board that was a basket case of a mess um, and going to press, going to the press and saying things and I would get calls from my colleagues saying, if that's true, I'm leaving. And I was like, oh, what, what, what just was said? <laughs> um, it's, it was, it's a mess. And, but what the, what the beauty of it was, was everyone came together because of the work we were doing. It never slowed down. I know that we had some folks who said, oh, it's great, keep working. I was like, we never stopped. Like, we didn't join this. We didn't come to this organization to, to do anything else other than our best for animals. So it was just working with staff, being as transparent 
as, as possible. And I remember I said, look, every Friday for the next year, I will tell you if something big is going to drop. And I remember one Friday, it was actually peaceful, it was maybe six months into it, and I didn't communicate it on it. And I tell you, people were like, what's up? And I was like, wow, I need to say nothing happened. <laughs> and it's really important to remember, just because you have the facts and you're sitting with stuff, People need to know. People need to know what's going on. And so it was just taking the time, um, working with everyone, changing out a lot of big problems. Uh, we did a board overhaul, governance. We did an entire governance new structure, which was amazing. We did an, ent we did an entire overhaul of our strategic plan. I listened to our staff. They said we had whiplash. We were working on one thing, jumping to the next. We worked with staff to focus on where we are uniquely good. Who else in the space is doing the work? And if a donor comes to us and said, we'd like to give you money for something and we're not working on it, we know a great group that does. Building more relationships and, and trust with other organizations. It just takes time and it wasn't about talk. We had a show, I had a show, and the leadership had a show that we're living this, we're doing it, and we're going to continue to do it, and we're going to keep calibrating. So we did a lot of check-ins to make sure, is this working? Is this not? And if not, why not? And just spending that time doing it. Um, I don't wish it on anybody. It's a rotten, horrible thing to have to go through. But boy, we emerged so much stronger. We are such a resilient organization. It is now one of our values that we have adopted. Um, we got our staff up to market comp, which was incredibly important to me. We recognized the value of each and every contributor. We pushed down decision rights. So many important things that if you think about it, it's like, sure, this makes a great organization. You have to be really intentional, very intentional to get the best that you can for your staff, for your people, and your supporters. We owe it to our supporters and, of course, the animals. Thank you for being so specific. I know, it, I'm sure it'd be easy to speak in kind of broad, uh, you know, generalities about, you know, generalizations about this and, and not dig into the difficulties. I really appreciate it. Um, and unfortunately, we're already, uh, or I mean, we're not done yet, don't worry, but we already are officially over time. Uh, but I feel like we just started this conversation. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions on here. There's some great questions in here that are... Nothing is actively off topic, but since we only have room for a couple more, I'm going to focus on the ones that I think are the most uh, directly related to the topic at hand and the ones that I think you both can speak to because I don't want to go too far into only letting one person uh, speak as we start moving towards wrapping this up. But uh, someone asked, and 11 people have upvoted this, um, what's uh, one big thing you would have done differently in the last five years and why? And you can obviously make five three or seven, I don't really care, but you know, broad, you know, broadly, what's something in the last handful of years you would have done differently and why? Either of you? So much. <laughs> I hope that's true of everyone because uh, we're supposed to always be learning and that's the point, right? Uh, maybe one thing to share that I think is something I'm bullish on these days and I'm trying to help more alternative protein companies focus on is um, I, went, I launched an alternative protein brand and went straight to consumers. Um, and that, I think, was a mistake. Um, and I actually think that um, there is massive opportunity right now for institutional procurement and focusing on big institutions. And here's why. Um, there are huge, huge purchasers. Uh, so there's massive scale. And unlike you all, um, no one tracks and measures and holds you accountable for your carbon footprint yet. Um, but certainly businesses are now being held accountable and ESG has created an opportunity that we can uniquely meet, which is a very real pain point. Say what it, ESG is, please. Oh, yes. So the, um, now companies are being measured and at the corporate responsibility, sort of non-financial reporting level, co companies like Google are tracking their carbon footprint and reporting on it and their, their performance. And now actually some executives' salaries are tied to environmental, social, and governance metrics. That is amazing. It means that businesses not only have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, but that we also have a responsibility to the broader ecosystem for doing well by doing good. 
and people are and gov and companies are being measured on that. And when it comes to selling a product or service, you need to understand that there's a real pain point in the market that you can uniquely solve. And it turns out that we can uniquely solve environmental pain points for big food service distributor for distributors and food service operators and um, schools and hospitals. And so um, those are companies, not individuals, and those companies are being measured, and we can help them achieve their goals, and they get big volume. So um, really, really excited about those, plus those kinds of commitments, um, those kinds of sales opportunities mixed with a lot of the cool innovation with people in this room on designing better choice architecture and default strategies to better sort of bias more healthy, humane, and sustainable outcomes, I think is Super exciting, a big win, and something that I tried to pivot my business to at the very end. The challenge is those relationships take a long time, and it's a hard and weird, funky sales cycle. So we need to be patient, and I hope most more alternative protein companies start focusing on institutional sales. I'll just take a moment moment to say, um, yes, lots of mistakes. I feel like in my, in my sixth year, I'm getting to be an okay CEO. I got a lot more to go. Um, it's just really important to keep keep pushing yourself and keep calibrating. That's, that's something that I've learned to keep checking back in. And uh, never think you have the right answer, which um, sometimes you want to just grab onto that. If I just get this, you think other things fall into place, but you can't forget about all the other things. I have so many lessons learned, it would take us well beyond, but uh, it's important to say, just keep grounding yourself in, in your staff, what you believe, and bring people along. Spend and take the time to make it meaningful. And if, you're, if you can't bring people along, you're not going in the right direction. So really spend the time to do it right. Absolutely, yeah. I love that quote, uh, what you just said. Say, can you say it one more time? Uh, what you said, if you can't bring people... Damn, okay. If you can't bring people along, you're probably going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I love that. I just wanted to say it again so people could, you know, keep it in their own heads because I think that's a, a very, very good point. And in fact, something I actually... I'm not going to go into specifics here because it's not animal or able related, but I learned a similar lesson just in the last few weeks, actually, something I was working on where someone who I was working for, I think, uh, was struggling to, to bring people along as well. And I realized that that was a, that was a, a him problem, you know? And, that, um, and I, I think it's something that, yeah, I think it's really, really important to keep in mind that not everyone has to agree with us, right? But if you can't even bring people that are already with us in many ways, if no one is buying what you're selling, then, you know, it might be the, it might not be it. Um, and I don't mean that in just a product way, but I mean more of a concept, you know, conceptual way. And again, there are so many great questions on here. I wish I could ask more of them. I think some of them, uh, before I ask you the last question I'm going to ask, this is just going to be a note more for the audience, um, or, may, or maybe, maybe where they can take some of these other great questions because I don't want them to feel ignored. It's just that we only had a little bit of time. Uh, there are other sessions on plant-based uh, meat and food where some of those can get asked. Uh, there are sessions on effective communication where I think some of these questions about infighting uh, can be asked. Uh, I, I encourage people who have these questions to, to go for you know, to, to find those sessions as well because I don't want your questions to never get answered. There are question uh, sessions on measuring effectiveness where those can get asked. So a lot of these questions have homes at this conference. Uh, so I'm going to, I think, end this with uh, the question that I think is most also relevant to this session and that I think after some of these tough questions is going to be a really great one to end this on, uh, which is someone asked each of you, um, what makes you most optimistic about our movement going forward? You all... It feels like the right answer. I mean, I'm so inspired and amazed by everyone here, and I feel like uh, just coming to a summit like Ava, I leave here feeling so hopeful and optimistic. So I think just a deep appreciation for you all and all the work that you do makes me hopeful. Fantastic answer. I wish I had gone first now. <laughs> What he said, no, it is, it is truly inspiring. 
all of the work, what everyone is doing now. I, I, yesterday, that's why I'm probably losing my voice. My daughter graduated from college in New York, and I was at Yankee Stadium, and I was screaming my butt off. Um, and just hearing her and her friends talk about it. So we went to an event afterwards. We went to three different vegan restaurants in New York, best meals ever. They were packed. People were in there, excited. It was not like that when I graduated. Could not find it anywhere. I'm just excited about what people are talking about, what they care about, how they're learning to use their voices in the most powerful and impactful ways. It's so important that we keep pushing ourselves, and I see everybody doing it every day. So I couldn't be more excited about where we're headed, where we're going. We are focused on the right things, and it's so important for the animals, for our health, for the climate, for the world. We're doing good. We're on the side of right, so I'm inspired by that. Yeah, thank you both. And before everyone gives you a final round of applause, which they're, they're going to certainly do, I just wanted to really note uh, the kind of bravery that it took to, to be on this, uh, on this session. I really, it means a lot to me. I think that most uh, people are excited to speak when they get to have their logo on a screen while they speak and when they get to talk about the best programs that they're doing and the proactive work they're doing. And I, they, neither of these speakers gave us any conditions. It wasn't like they said, yes, I will speak on this session as long as I also later at this summit get to, uh, you know, speak about what I want to speak on. This was a very reflective uh, session. Uh, it's not usual for an event like this. I uh, didn't actually think I was going to find speakers on these topics. Uh, when I proposed to my team uh, that we do a session where we actually address you know, real problems facing our movement and that have faced our movement and what we did about them in a way that didn't have any cute you know, videos or anything we could attach to them and really just involved being honest. So it means a lot to me as someone who values this kind of conversation and work that, that you two joined us. Uh, I think that this was a great way for all of us to be moving into the rest of the summit as we learn all the great work that we can do, keeping in mind this long arc that it's gonna take, keeping in mind the stumbling blocks we're gonna you know, run into. Uh, I, I thank everyone for staying through this session. Uh, the room is still completely packed. Uh, and I thank you two so much for uh, joining me for this, for this session. Let's give it up one more time for Max Elder and Kitty Block, everyone.